Hey there, and welcome back to How to Medicate, and welcome to this new video on upper eyelid surgery. In this video, we cover all the essentials. What is upper eyelid surgery? What are some reasons to do it? Some cosmetic ones, as well as some medical indications. I'll walk you through the whole procedure, step by step, and I will cover the potential risks of the surgery. And lastly, I will give you some post-operative advice. So stick for the video. If we're meeting for the first time, my name is Raul, I'm a finally a medical student and I'm making weekly medical videos to educate myself as well as you. So if you're interested, subscribe for more upcoming content. I also start with a little disclaimer, this video is meant purely informational, this is not medical advice and if you're looking for medical advice, always contact your own doctor. Now let's start with the video. And this brings us to the slides. An upper eyelid correction is called in medical terms a blepharoplasty. It's done to correct defects, deformities and even disfigurations of the upper eyelid by the removal or repositioning of excess tissue, mostly fat, muscle, skin and even tendon. It can have some functional indications as well as cosmetic reasons and it's mostly performed among women. 85 to 88 percent of all procedures is done among women but the percentage of men choosing for an upper eyelid correction is increasing rapidly each year. This brings us to the medical uses. In medical uses, the sagging of the upper eyelid can cause some complaints, mostly heaviness of the eyelids, as well as a tightness, a tiredness, mostly during the evening, as well as unexplained headaches. This can partially be explained by the constant raising of the eyebrows. Because when the upper eyelid is sagging, you try to compensate it by raising your eyebrow, by raising your eyebrows, and this causes part of the symptoms. Also, you will have a loss of peripheral vision. Because your upper eyelid is sagging, it will cover a part of your pupil, mostly on the outer and upper sides of your pupil, and this will lead to a loss of peripheral vision. So that can also be a great complaint. You can also see this in this picture. What's important to note is that there is no real causal connection between the symptoms, the severity of the symptoms somebody is experiencing and the severity of the sagging of the eyebrows. However, when your vertical palpebra fissura is less than six millimeters, it's very likely that the complaints you are having are caused by a sagging of the upper eyelid, as well as when the pupil coverage by the upper eyelid is more than 50% of the pupil itself then it's also very likely that your symptoms are caused by the sagging of the upper eyelid. And you can also see this in this picture. Then for the cosmetic uses, there's no real medical indication to perform the surgery. So those people mostly have no complaints. They just are looking for a fresher look or a younger appearance. Therefore, especially in cosmetic uses, it's recommended to perform the surgery on both upper eyelids to minimize the asymmetrical effect. Also, when choosing between local or general anesthesia, local anesthesia has a preference. It's not only cheaper, but it's also safer and quicker. So take that into consideration when planning your surgery. For the procedure itself, most people do it under local anesthesia. This is done by local injections of the upper eyelid, and after that you won't feel any pain no more. However, a small percentage of all patients chooses for general anesthesia, but this takes longer, is more expensive and has more risks. So take that into consideration. After the anesthesia, an incision is made in the upper eyelid. This is done in the natural skin lines to minimize the scar visible after full recovery. First of all, the excess skin is removed and some orbital fat can be removed as well if necessary. If there was also sagging, of the upper eyelid muscles as well as the tendon, those can be strengthened with some extra sutures and after that the wound is closed by some stitches and that's it. This is a small surgical procedure and as any surgical procedure this has some small potential risks. First of all a risk of bleeding, infection, wound healing problems, ugly scars and after 10 to 15 years there can be a recurrence of the sagging of your upper eyelid and maybe you need another surgery. And lastly, very, very rarely, a damaging of the optic nerve is seen. This is caused by bleeding behind your eyeball. And once more, it's very, very rare, but it's important for you to know that this could happen. And this brings us to our last slide, post-operative advice. 
The surgery itself takes roughly 30 to 60 minutes, depending on the experience of your surgeon. But the recovery takes six full weeks. The first two weeks, it's important that you do not lift any weights, do not press and do not do any exercises. Cool it with ice the first day every hour, but not in the evenings. You can just sleep and do not need to stand up to cool it with ice. But if you wake again next day, cool it every two to three hours and the third day, cool it every four to five hours, approximately 10 minutes per time. Then use an extra pillow so your head is a little bit higher. This will reduce the swelling. After two weeks, the stitches will be removed and you will be seen probably by a nurse. And then after six weeks, there's full recovery and you will often be seen by a surgeon. After this, you can start by massaging the scar and this will further decrease the swelling in your upper eyelid. And it's also very important that the first six months after your surgery, you will put on a lot of sunscreen. This will protect the scar. In a nutshell, this was my video on upper eyelid corrections. I hope you learned a lot. If you have any questions, ask them in the comment section and feel free to subscribe for more upcoming videos. And as always, see you next time. Bye bye.